It's been wonderful knowing you. <laughs> uh, it goes back 18 years. I had the privilege, uh, through the uh, good offices of Craig, of having somehow written a paper with Harold without ever having met him or spoken with him, which was quite an amazing. Uh, the paper doesn't get read. It's kind of this window dressing for their fantastic work at that time. But it was a pleasure, and I learned at that time that he was an unusually kind person, and I've uh, appreciated that then and appreciated it always ever since. <laughs> um, okay, so this is about uh, applications of a new type of, uh, not really new, but a new use of a type of symmetry that occurs in this study of integral systems called convolution symmetries. You'll see how that enters uh, as we go along. Now, I do have um, <clears throat> about 37, really 37 transparencies, so this is going to, I don't want to whip it along at a ridiculous rate, but there's always a, an introductory section to this talk in which I go over the theory of the tau function, and for some reason can't assume that three quarters of the audience knows it, so forgive me, I'm going to spend 10 minutes doing this review. If you know all this, just wait until it, I hope it will only be 10 minutes. Anyway, this is the outline. I'll give a review of KP and two tota tau functions in terms of infinite dimensional Grassmannians and loop, group, uh, linear uh, group actions. Um, tau function naturally appears as a finite or infinite determinant. And uh, I'll just give two simple examples of basic building blocks of tau for tau functions or the Schur functions. They all be expressed as linear combinations of Schur functions satisfying certain bilinear relations. A standard example is random matrix integrals. Then I'll recall the fermionic Fox space construction of these things, which is very natural. It all goes back to Sato and his school, and to some extent Siegel and Wilson. Then the second part of the talk is the main uh, content. I want to introduce a group, an infinite abelian group, which is not the standard flow group, uh, which I call convolutions on the Hilbert space underlying this, and uh, <coughs> it would be pretty obvious why it's <coughs> um, That's also an abelian group, but it is not equivalent to the usual flow group of KP, and there's an interesting interaction between the two. I'll give the Fox space and the fermionic representation, and um, the effect of convolutions on tau functions, very simple. In fact, this is what inspired this work in the first place, some, some work relating internally coupled and externally coupled matrix models, both of which are tau functions. These two can be related by applying one of these convolution symmetries, a very simple one. Then uh, with that one, related to matrix models. But uh, one can also think of it as an infinite abelian group, which generates its own flows and its own, so to speak, integrable hierarchy. However, it turns out that there exists an infinite family of intertwining operators such that even though these flows, the usual KP flows and the convolution flows are not equivalent, there's no way to conjugate one to the other, you can find a family of intertwining operators which maps one to the other by certain adjustment on the basis states. And I'll explain that. And then applications, the, the, the application in, in view of the fact that this is mainly a conference on random, uh, random processes is to crystal growth and uh, an interpretation, in any case, for the generating process. Okay, so here goes. A, tau, a KP tau function, a function of an infinite sequence of variables, T1, T2, sometimes called the flow variables, such that if you define the associated so called Baker Achieser function, which is obtained by translating T by multiples of 1 over Z, 1 over Z squared, etc., multiplied by this exponential factor, which is really an abelian group element, you obtain these dual pairs of uh, Baker function and this dual. You can write down an infinite set of bilinear equations for tau encoded in this one sim simple equation which says that the residue of the product of the two t being translated by an arbitrary set of parameters s is identically zero. That gives an infinite set of differential equations in t for tau which already has a, a bilinear form. So that's the basic definition. But the question is how do you construct these things? They, uh, what do they mean? Uh, and the usual applications are to generate solutions to the KP hierarchy, but in the applications I'm going to be talking about, they appear as generating functions for random processes, as random matrix integrals, as any number of other useful things, um, topological generating functions. So they really do have a very wide range of applications. So let's take as our model for Hilbert space square integral functions in a circle, divide it into the, into the, I think of it as Fourier series, you can divide it into positive and negative powers of Z in the circle, or those which which extend holomorphically to the inside or the outside with some normalization of infinity. Then the Grassmannian that we're going to talk about, which will be pertinent, yeah, okay. um, yeah, the Grassmannian which we need 
is a Grassmannian modeled on this subspace. So think of H plus, and you apply some sort of group action, general linear group action, and you're going to perturb H plus by an abelian flow group, which keeps it relatively close to H plus. So the points that you get in this space are subspaces that are in some sense commensurable with H plus. Mainly that means that the orthogonal projection to H plus is a Fredholm operator, and the opposite one is a, is a rather small. So it's sort of thinking of this as being close to H plus. <coughs> You introduce an orthonormal basis for reasons of convention. The monomials, the negative monomials, are associated with the positive integers. That's just to get the standard Dirac C as filled states on the left rather than on the right. And uh, if you have, a, in terms of frames, if you have a subspace commensurable with H with this basis, we can write that as a doubly infinite by singly infinite rectangular matrix in this basis. So the coefficients of W. The column vectors are capital W. Think of this as a two infinity by infinity Z by Z plus uh, matrix. So everything can be expressed in those terms. <coughs> um, in this basis, the multiplication, I mentioned that multiplication by Z uh, is just a shift operator. I'll, I'll have that later. Oh, here it is. So the, the multiplication by Z on this basis just shifts the monomial. So Lambda is just the shift operator, which is upper triangular with zeros everywhere except one above the diagonal. So you think of the flow group, which is generated by multiplication of L2 functions, either by positive or negative series in Z, where the TIs are the uh, exponential series, where the TIs are the uh, flow coefficients. It's obviously an abelian group. It acts on the Hilbert space, and it can be represented in terms of matrices by using this infinite W. Matrix. So, so it's a very simple representation of this shift flow um, on Hilbert space. More generally, we can have a, I won't define rigorously what is meant by GLH, but with some suitable definitions, we can have linear action, linear invertible actions. We want the determinant to exist, so I don't want to go into that. But this action, uh, which is just multiplication of um, each vector on the left by G, lifts to the uh, subspaces, so to the Grassmannian, just by taking a basis and acting on each basis element in the usual way. So that gives a natural lift of the general linear group action, which we could think of matricially. You think of this uh, G as an infinite exponential matrix with entries A, I, J, then this is simply multiplication of that, of that rectangular matrix on the left. There are convergence questions and so on, of course. Then, in the interpretation of Sato and Siegel and Wilson, the tau function can be interpreted as the determinant of the projection operator, of the projection of the moving point WT obtained by taking element, this here I'm writing as a rectangular matrix, uh, applying the shift flow abelian group, and then taking the determinant of the higher block, which is, of course, the, the uh, zeroth Flicker coordinate. But right now, we'll just think of it as, as a determinant. So this is the definition of Sato Siegel, Wilson. And they show, quite remarkably, that this essentially covers all of the tau functions that we ever need. So why does it satisfy the infinite bilinear relations? The Hirota bilinear relations turn out to be equivalent to the Plücker relations for the embedding of this Grassmannian <coughs> into a corresponding exterior uh, space formed from the Hilbert space. So we have the standard embedding in the projectivized Hilbert space. I'll define that more accurately later on. But basically, if you have the span of W, the Plücker map maps you into the exterior product of all of the basis elements. and. Uh, such decomposable elements satisfy an infinite set of quadratic relations, these are the Plücker relations, and those become, under the action of the abelian group, those become equivalent to the Hirota bilinear relations. So it's a purely geometrical interpretation of the KP hierarchy. Now let's look at the most elementary example of a tau function, namely Schur functions. For this case, I just have to tell you what the subspace W is. So there's a W lambda for which the tau function is the Schur function. And that W is just the sort of obvious thing. If you have a partition lambda, which you extend with an infinite number of zeros on the right, you uh, do the usual 45 degree rotation, lambda i minus i. So these are this, these are this is a strictly decreasing sequence that saturates in the, all the negative numbers eventually. Take the span of that, call it w lambda. Corresponding tau function is the Schur function. That's the basic building block for all tau functions. <coughs> I won't define the Schur function. I think most people at this conference know what it is. Second example, random matrix integrals. Here, you use the orthogonal polynomials to define your W. Basically, you have a, uh, for some measure, you have a sequence of orthogonal polynomials. 
you take this, think of those just as, uh, well, the polynomials in Z, so they can be thought of as elements of H plus. You can take all of the shifted elements starting at N, N, N plus 1, et cetera, all those polynomials, shift it down to bring it down to, uh, it'll be a Laurent polynomial if you divide by Z at the end. That gives you an infinite uh, dimensional subspace. It's commensurable. In fact, the Fredholm index is zero. And the space associated to that gives rise to a tau function, which has the familiar form that we recognize as the reduced uh, matrix integral for Hermitian ensembles, or even more generally, the gamma, the uh, contrary integration ensemble of the line. We have the Vanderbilt's determinant, an exponential factor, just the usual familiar form coming from the Weyl integration formula. So this is the usual reduction. So we identify the partition function for that measure with the tau function, where the deformations appear in these at uh, conjugation variant uh, abelian fact. So that's a second example. Now, an important fact is uh, we can now think of things, okay, that's, that's the Grassmannian formulation. Okay? Now I'd like to give you the, the fermionic formulation. So that leads to this Brooker map. So if we think of the fermionic Fox space as spanned by all semi-infinite exterior products formed from the basis elements of E, where this sequence L1, L2, et cetera, exactly is this rotated partition shifted by an integer N, which I don't want to go into, but it has to do with the Fredholm index and the projection of that. Um, then there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, configurations of infinite uh, sequences of, of uh, integers, which are strictly decreasing and saturated with all the negative integers, and partitions, pairs of partitions and integers n. So the fermionic Fox space, the exterior space formed of H in this sense, then it divi divides into sectors. These are the n, as I said, really is the Fredholm index of the projection operator, but it can, it, physically it's interpreted as, the, as the, the charge of the vacuum. So a typical basis element looks like that. The, I won't say how the n is identified, but this is an invertible correspondence. Basically, the n is the center of gravity of the sequence of occupation sites. If you think, like in many uh, uh, presentations, you have a uh, so-called uh, Maya diagram consisting of integer sites that are occupied and unoccupied, where everything on the right uh, becomes eventually unoccupied and everything on the left becomes occupied. If you look at the center of gravity, wh which point do you have as many blacks on the right as whites on the left? That's the integer n. Okay. So usually we'll just use uh, n equals zero. The vacuum is this sequence where you can replace capital N by n equals zero for most applications. And that's an orbit. It's an orbit under the general linear group under the Clifford representation. So this is the standard thing that the Clifford representation, well, I won't go into the details, but you take this basis and the dual basis for H star. And on the sum of H and H star, we have a natural quadratic form just using dualization, in which H and H star are separately totally isotropic and one is dual to the other. So you have a natural quadratic form. And with respect to that, you've got a Clifford representation on the exterior space. This is the standard construction of, of uh, um, the, uh, the unique irreducible representation of the Clifford algebra of lowest, uh, well, unique. Okay, so the way you think of it is that the we call these Fermi creation and annihilation operators. The creation are exterior product with the basis elements. Annihilation are interior product with the dual basis elements. And they satisfy the usual fermionic anti-commutation relations, which are the Clifford algebra generating relations. So everything is going to be constructed out of these. When we have a representation of a group on the, on the Hilbert space, it'll lift to, through the uh, Clifford uh, representation to a representation on the fermionic Fox space, which is the exterior space. And this is the Bricker map, which again, which maps an element into, the, into a completely decomposable element, which is only uh, determined up to an overall scale, an overall uh, scale factor, because you can always change the basis, and that will give you a determinant that multiplies this. And we have the orthogonal projection. So the Bricker map takes a subspace W into a linear combination of the standard basis elements that we're talking about, and these coefficients are what are called the Bricker coefficients. Or the Bricker uh, coordinates of the image. However, they're not independent. They satisfy the infinite set of Clicker relations, and therefore, uh, this is really an embedding. It's a sub-variety in, inside of the projectivized exterior space. <coughs> so, 
uh, this little clicker map, the gamma plus and minus group actions on the Grassmannian can be transformed into actions on the exterior space, on the Fox space, and the Clifford representation turns out to be very simple. You have a set of generators, sometimes called currents, J plus I, which represent the shifts in the positive or the negative direction of the first on the Hilbert space. And these are generated by bilinear, so this looks like uh, creation, Fermi creation and annihilation operators with a shift by distance n. If you think in terms of, of random processes where you have low, uh, occupied and unoccupied sites, you can think of this as something which has the effect of removing an occupied site at n plus i and shifting it to the left by i. So this is actually relevant for some of the, <coughs> some of the problems that were discussed in this work. So a general linear group element, which in the first quantized space has the matrix representation E to the A, in the Clifford representation goes over to this. So that's the, the way that we act on the Hilbert space. And then I can write down uh, the uh, equivalent representation to that determinant. It was a determinant, not surprising that a determinant is a Plicker coordinate, because all the Plicker coordinates are determinants. So in fact, this is a, a completely equivalent formula. If you just look at the definitions, it's trivial to verify that this is the same as the determinant of the projection operator. Uh, okay, set n equal to zero here. This is not important. Basically, this is vacuum state expectation value. G is the element which takes you from H plus to W. So G acting on H plus gives you the element of the Grassmann that we're interested in. It's a, the clicker map is equivariant. It intertwines these actions. So we just take the vacuum and act on it by the corresponding Clifford representation of G. That gives you a state. That state is a completely decomposable state, <coughs> that is a decomposable product. Then you take the representation, Clifford representation of the infinite flow group, and again, the scalar product of the vacuum. That's a determinant because it's a Clifford coordinate. It's actually the trivial Clifford coordinate of the moving point. So, so what that should be thought of is if I have a Clifford map, <coughs> the Clifford map takes my moving point Wt, which is gamma plus t acting on the initial point, into some element, let's call it W, of the, of the Fox space. And now you just take the uh, lambda uh, yeah. This is the so-called bosonization map, and this is the tau function. Whereas if I take the initial element and take its scalar product under gamma plus with uh, under gamma plus, no, just take the initial element and take its Plicker coordinate. That's the pi lambda that appears in the sum. Oh, did I give you some? I guess that went by perhaps a little bit quickly. Here's the Plicker image of this element. It's got Plicker coordinates. If you do the same thing for the moving element, <coughs> uh, and then apply the scalar product, you'll get the tau function. Okay. So here are the formulas, the fermionic formulas for the tau function. What, what I wrote before is just this vacuum expectation value of the product of g hat with gamma plus. There exists a, a more general type of hierarchy called the two-toda hierarchy, in which the n plays a role, and there are two sets of flow variables. KP hierarchy in either the t tilde or the t variables uh, is satisfied, and there are also some lattice relations. So this, this, here the difference is we've got g multiplied on the left by the gamma plus flow group. Here we have it multiplied both on the left and the right by the gamma plus and gamma minus, both of them are medium. Okay. So it follows from that representation, just choosing a basis that the kp tau function can be written as a, an infinite in general sum of over Schur functions, because the Schur function we saw was given by the standard basis corresponding to the lambda n elements. So it's simply the, the Plicker coordinates of the initial w element, which can be thought of as gh plus, multiplying the Schur function. So this is the general expression for any, tau, any kp tau function. For the 2kp case, we have a double Schur function expansion. And each of these can be thought of as Plicker coordinates in the first case of the, of the original element, in the second case with respect to 
acting on the basis element mu n bunch. We won't call it strictly. Okay, that's it for the introduction, and that took up, I guess, 15 minutes instead of 10. I did start a little late. Okay, so now I can get to the second part of the talk, but maybe I'll stop and ask. That went by quick, pretty quickly for those who haven't seen it before. Is there a clarification needed? No. All right, we'll move on. <clears throat> so now I'd like to get to these convolution symmetries, which is the main theme of the talk. So I'm going to introduce a new abelian group, infinite abelian group, which instead of looking like multiplication of elements on L2, S1, will look like a convolution product with uh, functions on S1. And that means the Fourier transform. It's multiplication of the, Fourier of the Fourier components. So here, let's think of these rho i's as the Fourier components of some function. Rho plus is the positive part. Rho minus is the negative part. Ratios of successive Fourier components will be written this way. And it will always be thought of as the exponential of some element ti, which, is, which will play the role of the flow variable. OK, so uh, this is just uh, normalization back to our rho. I'm going to assume that the row sequence is such that this converges as well. So the sum of the t's in the negative direction is fine. OK, so if we have an element of our Hilbert space, an element of L2S1 split that way, and we uh, multiply each of the Fourier components by the corresponding row i's, that, of course, is the convolution product with the function rho z. But that's a diagonal action in our basis, in which the row i's are the diagonal elements. So matricially, you can think of it as acting on W through a diagonal matrix whose entries are rho i. So that's the way it looks. <coughs> that's the matrix representation of the convolution symmetry. On the, uh, the fermionic level, the generators, remember we had the shift generators, which were not self-adjoint, uh, the Ji shift or the current, current generators. These, these are actually self-adjoint. They're just the diagonal terms of a creation and annihilation at the same point. Uh, you have to normal order in order to get finite uh, matrix elements. <laughs> this is an abelian group, so the, the second quantized or the Clifford representation will be written this way with the generators Ki. And it's a fact that's very obvious that since this is an exterior product of the basis elements on which these act diagonally, it follows that on the basis in the Fox space, it also acts diagonally, and the eigenvalues are given by this one. You have r lambda is equal to a certain fixed normalization factor involving a finite product of the terms. And this is the usual combinatorial factor that you get when you take a Young diagram and fill it in with some element and then shift upward to the right and downward as you go down. So basically, it's the product of r n minus i plus j over all the elements of the Young diagram. So those are the eigenvalues. And it immediately follows from what I said already. Since it acts diagonally in that basis, and the coefficients for a tile function are the Brooker coordinates, it means that the effect of translating on the left by g, but by c rho, convolution symmetry, is simply to take every Brooker coordinate and multiply it by the eigenvalue of that basis state. So this is the shifted tile function. It, by definition, it's a tile function because it's just another group element, namely this one. All of these are tile functions. So the surprising thing is that if you choose your multiplicative factors in this special way, which is just determined by the coefficients of some Fourier series for a, a function on the circle, then this product, pi lambda, rho lambda, also satisfies the Brooker relations if pi lambda goes. And this was actually the original inspiration for this, because there was a special case that was calculated by um, Dong Wang in relating <coughs> internally and externally coupled matrix models, and I just saw that this was a generalization of that that worked for all cases. The same thing can be done for, for uh, two toda, where you have uh, two factors, one for the left and one for the right, and uh, it works. So the Plutter coordinates for the modified Grassmannian is given by just multiplying the Plutter coordinates by this normalization factor determined by the convolution symmetry. One example, take the exponential series. The way things are, uh, conventions are set up, take the exponential 1 over z. Has to do with if you act C, that's 1 over Z rather than Z. So you have 1 over I factorial, and all the others, you just take identities. So that would be this Fourier series for 1 over 1. So here's the R lambda for that case. Plug it into the formula, and you get a new expansion. You start out with, let's say, a matrix model expansion in which the Plicker coordinates are just the, the determinants of the 
matrix of moments formed this way, this is a well-known formula for the sure function expansion of the matrix model partition function, you multiply each of these Flicker coordinates by that combinatorial factor r lambda of n, and lo and behold, you get the sure function expansion for the externally coupled matrix model in which the ti's are interpreters of the tracing variance of the external matrix. So there's one example which works beautifully of how you get a new matrix model out of an old matrix model by applying the convolution symmetry. Now I'd like to uh, go on to the, the new material. This uh, I presented this in various conferences, so it's not really new, and uh, it should appear in the uh, in that Berkeley MSRI series uh, publication. Um, by the way, I, I think I forgot to mention that everything I'm saying is joint work with uh, Alexander Orlov. I think he was on the first transparency. <coughs> Okay, now let's do something a little bit different. Let's treat the convolutional symmetries itself as a dynamical flow group, which replaces the usual shift flows. Can we construct tau functions out of that instead? The answer is yes, and again, it's inspired by examples. There are examples in the literature which have non-standard form. There's some, um, some examples of tau functions due to Paul Wiegmann, Bettelheim, and his their collaborators, and others, many of the examples of Okunkov, Reshetikin, Pandhari Pandey, are identified through fermionic formulas as, as, as tau functions, but if you look at their definition, they don't seem to follow the rules exactly. So the question is, what are these objects? Why are they tau functions? And this is an attempt at explanation of that. As I said before, there's no way that you can take two inequivalent flows and conjugate them into each other. So you have the flows given by the capital T i's, the convolution flows, and you have the shift flows given the little t i's. There's no way you can conjugate one into the other. But, the, and moreover, the shift operator is a very bizarre operator. It has no discrete spectrum. It's only continuous. And, well, there are lots of uh, funny properties, whereas so there's no way that you can really give it a matrix representation. However, what you can do is find for any sequence, any infinite sequence of complex numbers with some convergence uh, properties uh, imposed, you can form a doubly infinite matrix Qij from their powers. It's basically the Vandermond, a doubly infinite Vandermond matrix formed from these Qij's. This, it's very obvious, intertwines two actions, namely the shift action and the diagonal action. Whatever the Qs are, it's very strange, but it's obvious. If I take lambda and multiply this, this uh, Vandermond matrix, on the left by lambda, it's going to lift everything up by one power of q, and so that's each column of q is an eigenvector of that matrix. So that means that I can intertwine the shift action obtained by exponentiating gamma plus by the convolution action obtained by exponentiating uh, the, uh, the diagonal elements, where these things, if you do the calculation, will, be, will correspond to powers of, of lambda, so the powers of q in this case. So this is, a, this is a diagonal matrix, and this is a, an upper triangular matrix. Now, that's a very bizarre operator. If you try to think of it as an operator, a Fourier representation of an operator in L2, S1, you're sunk. There's no, it's in, none of the columns are square summable. It's not a bounded operator, it's just a matrix. Nevertheless, in some cases, I'm going to show you a nice case as my finishing example you can do uh, something which looks like a uh, lower upper triangular factorization, and then you're in business, because then everything that's defined either acts on a vacuum in a trivial way, or is square integrable as a perfectly good operator. So the idea, a typical physicist's approach is, take your operator, put into the dustbin everything that acts trivial on a vacuum, and even though the operator is bad to begin with, the resulting expression is well-defined because what's left over is a perfectly well-defined bounded operator. So that's essentially, so this is, this is the point at which we sort of part from rigor, but it's, if anyone has any good ways to turn this into legitimate functional analysis, I would be very happy to discuss it. But for the moment, just look at matrices, and I'll show you a beautiful example where you can do this factorization into upper, lower, and for that diagonal matrices, even though it's a nasty operator. So here's the diagonal part, which means it's a convolution symmetry. If the diagonal parts uh, are written as diagonalizes ij, that's the convolution symmetry. 
And let's just say that we have some lower triangular and upper triangular. I wrote two of them here because I'm going to apply this to the two Toda case to basically ignore the E tilde for the moment. We just have a lower and upper triangular factorization. If you second quantize that, that is, look at the Clifford algebra representation, the natural thing to look at is the upper triangular elements consisting of uh, creation and annihilation operators where j is bigger than i, or the other ones, the lower triangulars where j is smaller than i. And the intertwining relation tells us that this, um, if we lift that, if it makes sense to lift that to the fermionic box space representation, that we'll have, here's the product of whatever is the Clifford representation. This is where the rigor is missing because, because the whole Q operator doesn't have a good Clifford representation, but the individual factors could have a good Q representation, which, which converts. So we have the product of three operators, and acting on the left by the, the Clifford representation of the, of the shift flows is the same as acting on the right by the Clifford representation of the convolution flows. So here we have, we've lifted this intertwining to the Hilbert space representation, to the uh, Fox space representation. So that's the basic trick. Uh, the QJIs here are defined as the linear combination. So this is a new basis determined by our choice of our Q matrix. And uh, so, so the uh, convolution operator can be written as C of large T's determined as linear combinations of little T's uh, with powers of the Q. Here's the theorem, which underlies everything. If I take, let me see, which is the familiar one. This is the usual. KP tau function for a certain group element G of Q. Um, and the statement is that this is equal up to the uh, normalization factor related to that uh, factor to the standard, sorry, this, this is the standard tau function. Here we have the group a group element acting on the vacuum. Here, instead of having the shift flow, we have the convolution flows, which is the abelian group. And here, instead of having the vacuum, we have the upper triangular part of Q acting. The lower triangular part, when acting to the left, acts like the identity. It's trivial, just because of the definition of the, of the vacuum state. So in fact, this is the only effective part of the Q operator. And this is a perfect, you'll see, this is a perfectly well-defined operator for particular values of Q. Same thing for the two toda. Only here we have a symmetric kind of left and right thing. We have two sets of convolution flows, one corresponding to the original Ts and the other to the second set of Ts. But the thing is that the group element that enters here is not the same as the group element here. It's something that, of course, that's modified. The group element G is multiplied on the left by the whatever that Q operator is, and that may be an illegitimate thing. So actually, this is the thing that we want to have, and what G is is the question. It's, it's, it's a standard total, total tau function if you're willing to admit a G that is related to a good group element by something which is definitely not good. It's not the representation of a bounded operator. So that's, that's a little bit tricky. But since everything acts on the vacuum, it actually makes sense. So the one example that I'd like to finish with, I guess since I, the Elks uh, took away a bit of my time, so I'm going to take another five minutes. Is that all right? <laughs> well, we started more than five minutes. OK, so let's take one really easy example. Suppose that all of the QJs up to a phase factor are powers of a single element which is in the uh, unit disk. Okay. Take that. And so this is a double power, Mn. We can rewrite that by, uh, as, as the uh, square of M, M and N and replace the left and the right. So this is the obvious identity. But this is very nice because this is a a Gaussian quadratic factor, and this is the diagonal factor. So thought of as matrices, what we have is triplets matrices, which are only determined by the distance from the diagonal, and the, and, uh, well, it's a covariance, but basically it's dropping one into Gaussian. So uh, I can take the Qs, and when I represent them as matrices, I can replace the uh, multiplication by Z, by the lambda, and what we have here is something that's rather familiar. We've got a diagonal term with the with a Gaussian distribution here. Uh, and here we have something which involves either positive diagonals or negative diagonals, depending on the power of lambda. But it's a triplets matrix in which the distance 
from the diagonal determines everything. This this a was meant to be something else. B to it's supposed to be an e here. So we got a Gaussian distance from the diagonal. But if you look at it in terms of, I mean, lambda, the lambdas all commute, so you can put a parameter instead of lambda. And what you have there, it's uh, essentially a theta function. <coughs> Fourier transform of Gaussian is a theta function. So let's use Jacobi. Jacobi knew everything. The Jacobi triple product formula allows us to make the uh, Birkhoff decomposition of the matrix. So here we go. Here's the uh, theta function series as an infinite product. And Jacobi helps us. He divides into the positive and the negative powers and a diagonal term. And we can reinterpret this by replacing the, the z's by lambda as a factorization of our Q matrix. In which we have only lower triangular and upper triangular. This is the, the uh, upper triangular part. This is the lower triangular part. So you can express each of the terms in the infinite product in the standard way with a logarithmic series, uh, exponential of a logarithmic series. And we start to get something that looks very much like the gamma plus and gamma minus group actions that we had in the first place, but in terms of specific coefficients determined by powers of q. Okay? So this is what's going to appear as the operators that change the vacuum into some kind of dress state. They don't depend on the t's, but they are what we sometimes call the boundary fixing operator uh, following the terminology of Paul Wheatman. So the result is uh, I have factorized this particular QK, uh, big of, uh, matrix Q. And the factorization has led me on the left to an infinite product of gamma pluses evaluated for specific values of the parameters, which are powers of the Q and this phase factor. And uh, everything is well defined. Everything, all of these terms are well defined as actions on the Fox space. So we can do that. We, we can replace the plus and minus components of the Q by shift uh, flow operators evaluated at these special points. Multiply them all together, and we just have a, a boundary fixing operator that is of the type gamma plus or gamma minus for special values of the T's. So the final formula for, a two to, for one tota is this. You've got some group element, the convolution flows, and this boundary fixing operator, which is in the form of a product of gammas. If you specialize this further, okay, sorry, this is the two total case, same thing, with boundary fixing operators on the left and on the right, in this case the Q plus and the Q minus, they're given by gamma plus and gamma minus terms. And as a particular case, let's just take our modified root element and choose it to be the identity. Yeah, I have to finish up. Uh, this is the last. Um, choose the parameters in a simple way, identify the left and right total parameters and put in a normalization half, and you obtain this form of the tau function, where these are, this is just an infinite product of gamma pluses evaluated at different powers of q, same thing here, and here's your convolution flow. This formula is the exact formula, you can look it up, that appears in the paper giving the generating function for crystal growth uh, due to uh, Nakatsu and Takahashi, and also in some of Pokunko's papers, more generally, uh, this kind of formula, we have gammas on the left and gammas on the right, and some kind of flows in the middle can be seen throughout all of the papers by Okunko, Panthari, Pandey, and Resortikin. So this is an interpretation of why those are really tau functions in the usual sense. So that's the end of my talk. Uh, here's some uh, references, Bettelheim, Okunko, and company. And thanks to all the participants, this is the last day, and then most especially 